We've been in this series, uh, the big picture, Genesis through Revelation. We're in the second last week. We've been sort of fast forwarding through the Bible. And just a little bit of review over the last couple of weeks to set up kind of where we're going this morning. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we were in the Gospels. And Pastor Terry kind of talked about this idea that the Gospels really is the story of God with us. And uh, then last week, we shifted to the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the believers and that shifted this reality of God with us to God in us. And so today we come to the epistles or the letters to the churches in the New Testament. And the letters were really written by these apostles to churches, some specific local churches, some broad regions of churches. But they wrote to these churches to encourage the believers to live out of this new reality of God in us. And so if you were to read through uh, these letters, that's kind of the heart behind it is, you know, to, to help the, these new followers of Jesus understand this new life they've been given, this God in us kind of life. So this morning what I've done is uh, I've actually written a letter to our church, to Okotoks Alliance Church, sort of in the spirit of like the Apostle Paul or James, brother of Jesus, who wrote one of the letters, you know, in the same kind of spirit, I thought, you know what, I'll write a letter to our church. And as we're kind of getting uh, started here, if you're on, uh, if you're viewing on Facebook and you want to use the chat, I would encourage you to maybe think of What's, uh, what's one of your sort of great memories of Okotoks Alliance Church? Or if you're here in this room, I give you permission, pull out your device, go on Facebook, follow our live stream, and just put something in the chat that says, you know, this is one of my great memories of Okotoks Alliance Church. Because as I was sort of preparing this letter, um, I was thinking of lots of memories, lots of things that I just couldn't put into, into writing. Um, so in the spirit of the apostles, I've pulled out my parchments, and uh, I've got this letter to read to you this morning. Um, and we could be here a little while, but uh, no, just kidding. It's not actually on there. Um, I just thought I'd have a little bit of fun with that. So I really did want to write on parchments and pull out the scroll, but I thought the iPad's a little bit easier. So, so yeah, if you've got a memory, share it in the chat and just kind of think through Okotoks Alliance Church, this church family. And here is uh, a letter a letter to you. So I am going to read this pretty much verbatim, which is not typically my style. So I apologize for not looking you in the face. Uh, I will probably be fairly glued to this. It really is a letter uh, from, from me to you. So to the family of God known as Okotoks Alliance Church, to those who have been with us, are presently with us, or are yet to be with us, greetings. I, Craig, one of your pastors and your brother in the Lord, write this letter on my own MacBook. Actually, I guess it's your MacBook that you so generously provided to me through your faithful giving. Wow, as I stop and think about it, I am truly blessed. It's because of your generosity that I have a home to live in, a fridge with food in it, a vehicle to get me around, and I've enjoyed 15 years of raising a family in this beautiful community of Okotoks. I want to thank you personally for your generosity that's blessed my family. And it's not just me that's benefited. Through your partnership in our shared desire to follow Jesus together and our mission to see him transform lives through relationships, you have given faithfully and generously over the years. You've given towards buildings being built, renovations being made, salaries being paid, international workers being sent out, disciple-making ministries to exist, and many practical needs to be met in the lives of our church family and the community we find ourselves in. James the Apostle says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Thank you, church for being an instrument of God to bring his generosity and blessing to my life, to our church, our community, and our world. As I think of my journey with you over the years, so many memories come to mind. Memories that go well beyond material gifts. Memories that speak to the life the Father desires to impart to each and every one of us through the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. 
I think of the many baptisms I've witnessed and been a part of. And when I think of baptisms, I can't help but remember double-dipping young Katie. And if you weren't there that day, we were in the river. Uh, Katie's mom and myself were baptizing her, and we, we put her down into the water and started to bring her out and realized she wasn't fully wet. So we double-dipped her. We dunked her back down and hoping she caught enough breath before we put her under again. Um, we had some laughs over that, and I'm thankful to be able to laugh with you as a church family. But the act of baptism reminds us of the powerful work of transformation that Jesus is working out in each of us who've put our trust in him. The Apostle Paul says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Church family, We've been made alive in Christ. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. That means if you've received Jesus, you've been given a new life. You are a new creation. You were once dead in sin and the consequences of sin, but now you are alive in Christ. And you have access to a full life, the life that Jesus promised in John chapter 10. So I urge you, live in this new reality. Live in the fullness of this new life we've been given. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul tells us about a great mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Imagine that. Christ is in you. Church family, Jesus is amazing. And through the Holy Spirit, he now lives in you and he wants to do an amazing work in and through you and in and through us. This idea of being a new creation in Christ reminds me of one of the weddings I officiated among us a number of years ago. This one couple came to me and asked me to officiate their wedding and I was overjoyed. Overjoyed because this bride had pretty much made a vow at one point in her life that she would never get married. Her journey as a young girl and the wounds she received from her younger years had justified this stance, in my opinion, that is outside of divine intervention. So when this soon-to-be groom met with me to tell me the great news that they were getting married, she had finally said yes after a number of proposals. I was overjoyed and thrilled to have a part to play in this story of transformation. At the wedding, I commented that this really was a testimony of God's amazing grace and transformative power. To bring that woman and that man together in that moment truly was a holy moment. You see, Jesus is in the business of changing lives. And if we trust him and follow his lead, he'll change each one of us from the inside out. It reminds me of Paul's words in Philippians 1, verse 6 that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So church, Jesus wants to carry on the work he's begun in each and every one of us. He's not done with us yet. So don't give up hope when you feel like you're not making progress. When you look at your life and wonder if anything is changing, let me encourage you to keep looking to Jesus and keep inviting him to work out his purposes in you and in his timing. As I think about this idea of transformation, this God in us reality, I'm reminded of Paul's words to the Ephesians in chapter two, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Church family, I wonder if you see yourselves the way God sees you. Do you look at your life and believe this statement to be true? Can you say with conviction, I am God's work of art? And my life is being formed by Jesus at work in me? Do you believe this? Because our loving Heavenly Father does. He is so proud of each and every one of us. He has hopes and dreams for us. He has plans and purposes for us. And it's not because of our great efforts, but his mighty power at work in us. 
As I think about your names and reflect on your faces, I feel like I have a glimpse of the Father's love for you. He sees you. He loves you. And he's at work in you. Through Jesus, we are God's children, and we are deeply loved by him. And speaking of children, as I continue to think about my journey with you, OAC family, I'm reminded of the many child dedications I've facilitated over the years. Numerous babies and young children have been dedicated by their parents, and I've been privileged to speak words of blessing over them and to pray over them and to challenge you parents to do your best to lead your children to Jesus. These moments that come to mind remind me that faith really does begin at home. And in this world of COVID that we find ourselves in these days, this concept of faith at home is highlighted even more. Parents, our children need us to live out our faith at home. Sorry, our children need us to live out our faith in Jesus from Monday through Saturday and not just on Sunday. They need us to talk about our faith in Jesus and to pray with them and for them. The future of the church really does depend on our ability to pass the baton of faith in Jesus to the next generation. And we're somewhat limited as an organized church in this COVID world, and we need to take a more homegrown approach to making disciples, an approach that begins with each and every one of us. So as one of your pastors, I'm here to help you do this. Let us encourage and equip you for the task of raising your children to follow Jesus. Please ask us if you need some help or encouragement, and don't be afraid to talk to one another and pray for one another in this task of reaching the next generation. Share your ideas with each other. We each need to take responsibility, but we also need each other's help and encouragement. And going back to these memories of child dedications, one of the questions I ask of us as a church in those moments is if we'll do whatever we can to support each family in their endeavors to lead their, their children to Jesus. It may be that faith formation begins at home, but it's also meant to be shared with one another. And this wasn't in my notes, but I've just got to share this. There is a grandma in our church who joined our youth Instagram account. And the deal with her when she said, she asked, can I join the youth Instagram account? And I said, yeah, that would be awesome. But I'm going to ask you, Every time we post something, please pray for our youth. And she's been praying for our youth every time we post something on that account once or twice or three times a week. Thank you. And thank you for all of you for pitching in, helping us raise our children together. Now I don't know where I was. Uh, one of our young moms, one of our young moms speaks of the OAC family as her village and this village is viewed as necessary to her and her husband as they raise their children and grow in their faith in Jesus. And this idea of a village speaks to the beauty of the church. We are a body of believers knitted together by Jesus who is the head of the church. Each of us has a role within the body. Each of us is needed. Each of us belongs to one another. The Apostle Paul says it so well in 1 Corinthians 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Church family, as I think about this image of the church as a body, I'm reminded of the many people and the many parts of this body who do their part so faithfully and at many times sacrificially. I wish I could thank you all by name, but the list would be too long. Thank you for being the hands and feet of Jesus in so many ways. Thank you for teaching and serving in Kid Zone and youth ministries. Thank you for leading life groups. Thank you for sharing your musical and technical gifts to lead us in worship. Thank you for welcoming people and feeding people. Okay, maybe not feeding people during COVID, but you know what I mean. Thank you for repairing things around the building. Thank you for praying for people. Thank you for going to faraway places to share the love and good news about Jesus. Thank you for doing your part 
in big ways and small ways, in behind the scene ways and upfront ways. Thank you for everything you do as the hands and feet of Jesus in our church, in our town, and in our world. Listen to these words from Paul in Ephesians 4. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Church family, we need each other. And we need to continue to work together to become fully mature in Jesus and attain the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now that's a big task. And to attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So let me pray for us the way Paul prayed for the Ephesians in chapter 3. Where he said, for this reason... I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. And here's his prayer. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. But wait, I'm not done. <laughs> Sometimes Paul said amen in the middle of his letters and then he kept on writing, so that's what I'm going to do. I want to close this letter with a few thoughts about living in the midst of this COVID reality we're finding ourselves in. COVID has changed the way we operate as a church. Some changes have been big, some changes have been small. Many of these changes have been disruptive and challenging and I want to speak some words of hope to the challenges we're facing as a church these days. So let me start with a few thoughts about gatherings. In our current reality, gatherings is a bit of a buzzword, a word we're trying to figure out and define. And generally speaking, the larger the gathering, the less appealing or even the less acceptable. And this reality really hit home when I watched the Stanley Cup playoffs this summer with no fans in the building. That's when it you know, really struck me. But small is becoming more acceptable. And in the church, though there are permissions to meet, our gatherings look and feel very different than they did a year ago, if we were to look around right now and compare it to last year. It's very different. We're either gathering online, or if we're gathering in person, we're spread out, there's less socializing, there's no contact, and we're wearing masks. And in the midst of all this, I'm reminded of the words in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Our gatherings are being put to the test these days and it doesn't always feel great. But in the midst of the disruptions to our gatherings, I've been asking the question, Jesus what could it look like for us to gather together during this season of COVID? And here's a couple of things that I've been pondering. I believe small is good. When Jesus walked this earth, he gathered with people in large groups called the masses, small groups like house parties and meeting with his disciples, and an even smaller group of three when he met with Peter, James, and John. And I wonder if during this COVID season, Jesus might be inviting us to take our eyes off the large gatherings for a time in order to spend some intentional time in the smaller gatherings. For the most part, small gatherings are still permitted, although with the latest regulations that just came out a couple days ago, we're still trying to make sense of all that. But for the most part, smaller gatherings are still permitted. So we need to be creative in how we meet 
It's fairly clear to me that the smaller the gathering, the more able we are to meet, the more able we are to stay connected, and even if it's just by text or video chat instead of an in-person meeting, a smaller group has this ability to connect and to gather and to encourage one another. A second thing I see related to gatherings is that this season is an opportunity to shift from being program-driven to being relationally driven. Earlier in my letter, I commended us for serving in so many ways. But much of our serving is driven by the programs necessitating it. And I believe this season we're in is an opportunity for Jesus to stir us to serve through relational needs and motivations versus the needs of maintaining and sustaining programs. Part of the reason for gathering is to encourage one another. How might you reach out and encourage others in our church family during this season of COVID? Church family, I want to encourage you to consider how you can maintain the value of gathering with other believers during this COVID season and consider also who in your life you can be reaching out to to maintain meaningful, Jesus-centered relationships. We need each other. This value isn't going to change. But how we meet together can change. So let's invite the Holy Spirit to lead us with divine motivation and creativity as we endeavor to continue to meet together in changing ways. And now to the matter of singing. Did you catch what I did there? Sometimes Paul said, and now to food, you know, the matter of food, sacrifice to idols, you know, trying to write like Paul here, so. And now to the matter of singing and to make light of a really touchy subject. Anyways, Uh, Singing is kind of the forbidden topic in church these days. I know this has been a touchy and difficult subject in our church family over the last number of months, and one of the things I love, love about our church is that we love to sing. So I feel your pain if you're feeling pain. I've preached in other churches where I've wondered whether anyone was singing at all, and it's made me realize that singing really does bring life to a gathering, and singing really is something I love about our church family. Now I don't know where I am because I keep saying stuff that's not in here. Uh, Oh yeah, singing brings life to a gathering. Okay, so... I don't want to start a debate about whether or not we should be singing. I don't want to stir up negative feelings, but I do want to mention this touchy subject and simply address it by asking a question. Could it be that Jesus might want to teach us something as individuals and as the body about singing and worship during this season of no corporate singing? Or maybe a more straightforward question might be, Jesus what are you wanting to teach me or do in me during this season of no singing? I'm reminded of Paul's words in Romans 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. The posture of worship described in this verse goes far beyond singing to the act of offering ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. Now, if you think about a sacrifice, it usually costs something or is painful, especially if you're the one being sacrificed. Some of us are experiencing pain during this season of no singing. We're grieving a loss, but that's kind of what a sacrifice is like. Could it be that this season of no singing is actually an invitation from Jesus to a deeper form of worship, both individually and collectively. I could talk about some of my own experiences, but let me simply say that I don't believe our worship is simply defined by singing. I leave this with you to ponder and ask Jesus what he might want to do in you during this season of no singing. And this isn't in my notes, but I'll reinforce it. I grieve the loss of singing like I know many of you do. But I think Jesus might want to do something in us during this time. There's much more that could be said about the impact of COVID on our church family. But let me conclude with a final word of encouragement for this season we find ourselves in. Listen to James as he writes in James 1. 
Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I'll just say that again. I don't know if you caught it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. That's counterintuitive. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Remember the beginning of this letter when I was talking about the work that Jesus wants to do in us and how he wants to bring us to full maturity and to obtain the full measure of the fullness of God. And remember all those happy thoughts and feelings that we were feeling when I was reading that? That wasn't in my notes. I'm just hoping that you were feeling good in that moment. But do you remember that? This season of COVID is a bit of a trial. And according to James, we are to consider it a season of joy because if we persevere through this time of testing, we can be mature and complete in Christ, experiencing the fullness of the full measure of God. So let's invite Jesus to continue the work he started in us even in the midst of this challenging time we find ourselves in. Let's embrace him and stay strong in our faith in him. He is unchanging in the midst of all this change, and he can lead us to a place of maturity through these challenges. Jesus isn't done with us yet, so be encouraged, stand strong, and keep the faith. Church family, as we endure these days together, let me close this with a word of blessing over you. And this will be the end, I promise, this time. So let me just speak a word of blessing over you. May God our Father pour out his love into our hearts. May Jesus be our good shepherd in these days. And may the Holy Spirit fill us, empower us, and awaken us to live as faithful followers no matter what circumstances come our way. May we continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our homes, in our town, and in the world in which we live. And may the peace and presence of Christ be near to us in these days. Amen.